Amen. You happy to be in church today? Anybody love Jesus today? Anybody? Anybody at all love Jesus? Amen. Amen. So we're, we're going into, it's, it's, week, or it's week two of the You Asked For It series. And um, Pastor Ricky said last week when he preached on the Old Testament, uh, he, he talked about the fact that we've gotten so many questions from you guys. We try to take those questions and build a series around it because it's something that Jesus did. Jesus would take questions and then he would preach answers to people. And it was a beautiful thing. And so we got five questions all on the topic of boundaries boundaries. Now, the reason we got these questions, I believe, is because a few months back, we started three different classes here at Grace on boundaries. One is Thursday nights, just on boundaries, and then we've got two on Sunday afternoon, and they're on boundaries in marriage. And so I think that has stirred up some questions, and we got five of them. So my little disclaimer before we get started is you asked for this one, folks. (laughs) <laughs> you asked for this one. So uh, let me give you just a taster of some of the questions that came through. How do you love people who choose to live a destructive lifestyle? What's the biblical basis for setting boundaries that protect my family from toxic people? The Bible says to turn the other cheek. So are boundaries even loving? Practically, what's a loving way for a Christian to set boundaries? I'm going to take all of these and just kind of wrap them up under one big question for this message today. And that is, are boundaries unchristian? Are they unloving? Are they selfish? Are you ready? I know I said it already, but you asked for this. I've never preached this before, and it's good. It's a good message to be able to talk about because I think this is something that sometimes we assume may be too much. I would also say that there's a lot of passages in the scripture where boundaries and healthy boundaries are implied more than they are said in a straightforward way. So we're going to pull a lot of that out today, and I think you're going to be really shocked at how much scripture there is about having healthy boundaries in your life. Now, we often focus on you need to be more compassionate, you need to be more giving, you need to be more uh, unselfish in your life, right? Like that's the way that you, that's what you're used to hearing at church. And we need to push that because some of us really need to to break out of a selfish mindset. Um, WebMD which is an interesting source, um, defines narcissism like this. Narcissism is extreme self-involvement to the degree that it makes a person ignore the needs of those around them. So we can be in a place, and some of us are in a place, or we tend this way, we lean this way, where we're more focused on our own needs to the point that we tend to ignore other people. We struggle to enter into what they're doing. And the way that the Bible often talks about this is a person who's in this place and they give into it on a regular basis, they're an idolater. And what it means is the throne of their life, the thing that they worship and the thing that they prioritize above all else is themselves. They are on the throne of their life. That's narcissism. So, so we're trying to get you to break free of that. But what about the other side of the equation? What about codependency? So glad you asked. Here's what codependency is. Again, according to the same source, a pattern of behavior in which you find yourself dependent on approval from someone else for your own self-worth and identity. It's not just that you give, it's that you have to give. It's not just that you help people, it's that you help people, and if they're not happy, you can't be happy. And if they're mad at you, they're disappointed in you. You can't sleep at night because of the brokenness that's there. It just gets down into you and and it, 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 it freezes you. You can't do the things that maybe you should do because you know you need to make these people happy. See the, see the dependency in the word codependency? I'm dependent on them being happy, and that's not a healthy place to be either. Look at this verse, John 5, 44. Jesus said this. It says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Jesus said part of what gets in the way of you Just living your entire life for an audience of one, Jesus Christ, your Savior, is that you live for other people. And you need 
them to be happy with you. That's worship. So, so if the narcissist puts themselves on the throne of their life instead of Jesus, the codependent person puts other people on the throne of their life. Not intentionally. It's just the way that we live. Luke 16, 13. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And I know it says don't be enslaved to money there, but this is a broader principle. Pick your item. Because many of us wake up one day and we find ourselves enslaved to something. And it can be money, it can be pornography, it can be alcohol, it can be a whole lot of things in your life that you find yourself enslaved to. Or it can be pleasing people. And that's what we're talking about today. Everybody starts as a baby, right? Still got your belly button? <laughs> right? We all start as a baby. And we're all right there with mama. And we're completely dependent on mama. And, and, and if you could actually talk to a baby, which, I mean, you can, but they're not going to talk back. But if you could, I don't think they even see much separation between them and mama. But after that, they kind of grow out of that and they become independent, do they not? And they start to take those first few steps of independent. And they start to say that amazing, miraculous word, mine. <laughs> it's my toy, right? I want my way. I don't want that baby food. I want chicken nuggets, amen? <laughs> like they've got their agenda. They've got their will. And they're supposed to have that. So what they're doing there is they're drawing the boundary lines of themselves. And I'm a me, and I'm not you, and this is where I belong. And, and that is something that all of us need. And even as adults, we need that, and that's healthy. I'm going to submit to you today that that's healthy. And you're like, well, isn't that sinful? Yes, sin comes into the picture. But the part where I understand that I am me, and these are my things, and these are my property lines, my jurisdiction, if you will, that's healthy. It's good for me. Sometimes in parenting, we say things like, you got to break their will. No, you don't. Don't break their will. They're supposed to have a will. Redeem their will. They need to have their will intact and strong so they can give their will to Jesus. Right? Jesus will not coerce us. Jesus will not force us. Jesus will call to us from outside our boundaries and say, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. Amen? Come on, second service. Come on. See, God structured it this way, and it's implied in everything that God said is that you have a structure around you. You have your own jurisdiction, and I stand outside of it on purpose. Because if you give yourself to the living God, you will do it freely. And that's the way that he wants it to be because it's good. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, in the context of Galatians there, it's talking about the Old Testament law. Pastor Ricky preached on the Old Testament law last week. Wasn't that amazing? He reminded us that there were 613 laws in the Old Testament. And there's a bit of a feeling in the Old Testament that, that like, it's almost like God spiritually got a gun pointed to our head. And I know this is a terrible illustration, but it's like that. And if you don't do everything that I've told you to do, you're going to go to hell. And that's the way many of us took it. And we felt fear about it, and we felt coerced about it. It's part of the reason that Jesus came and died and said, no, I've taken care of all of that. I've taken care of it all. I don't care what people have told you in church. But Jesus came and died for all your sin and all the sin you're about to do, because you're going to do more today, amen? And he died for all of it and said, there's no gun pointed to your head. You do not have to live in fear. You're saved. You've given your heart to Jesus Christ. He's forgiven everything, past, present, and future. And so you get to live in freedom. And so everything that you do from this point forward, if you choose to love God, if you choose to worship God, like we gave you three songs, three opportunities today to give your heartfelt worship to the living God, if you do that, it should be from your own heart, not because anybody coerced you. It's for freedom that Christ sets you free. 
1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Do you see his agenda here? He's like, you shouldn't be a slave. Jesus died to free you from slavery. And so if you're a Christian today, you should actually care about your freedom. You should care about your boundaries. You should. Like, Jesus died for it. It should matter to you. Look at this one, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We talk about this verse a lot when it comes to giving financially to the church. So when you give, you should give with a cheerful heart. It shouldn't be because some pastor twisted your arm, made you feel guilty. None of that should be the reason why you gave money. And so, so we talk about it in the context of giving, but I think the principle here is much, much deeper. Anything that you give to God ever or to another human being should not be because you got guilted into it, forced into it. Why? Because that's not surrender and love. That's theft. Do you think that God could come in and force you to do his will? Heck yeah, he could. Yep, you wouldn't last two seconds. He'd get exactly done what he wants done. But that's not his way. He stands back outside your boundaries and says, I stand at the door and knock. I'm going to knock because the door handle is on your side. You're the one who gets to choose. And when you choose, if you choose, if you would let me in, if you would love me, if you would give to me, if you would surrender to me, that surrender will be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Because it comes from a strong child of God who knows who they are and was not forced into it. The deeper the freedom, the deeper the surrender. And the deeper the surrender, the deeper the beauty. We're going to get to beauty. God will not steal from you, and he will not trespass over your boundaries. You can invite him in, but he will not trespass. So we've got personal boundaries, but we also have family boundaries, right? Let's look at family boundaries. Genesis 2.24 It says, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And what the Bible's describing here right, right away in the book of Genesis is, is what's underneath the beginning of most wedding ceremonies. So I stand there with a, a groom and a bride, and she's there with her parents, and I say, who, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And they say, we do. And what are they saying? We're giving her away. That, that's pretty brutal language, isn't it? Like, we're giving her away. What, what, what are you saying here? What we're saying is, she used to exist within the boundaries of our immediate family, and we were responsible for her. We told her what to do, right? And, and it's both of them. I'm not being sexist. It's both of them, right? They're both coming from a strong family situation with their own boundaries, and they're coming into a new family situation, and they're going to decide what they're going to do with their money. Most moms and dads should be weeping if they understood what it really meant, what they were doing in that moment. They're going to decide where they live from now on. They're going to decide what jobs to take. They're going to decide how to raise their kids. Oh, come on. <laughs> right? We are no longer in your immediate family. And that offends some of us. But it's necessary. Do you see the Bible talking about boundaries here? It's like the lines, make, they make a difference. And you have to know, and you have to know how it works because they are a brand new family and their loyalties have changed and their loyalties are supposed to change. That's hard. Money and job and everything. I remember um, there was a time and, and we went and we visited family and our kids were tiny, you know, and they're toddlers and they're running around and it was time for naps. And in our house, naps was, that was a big deal because if the nap didn't happen in the right way on time, it was going to be a bad day for everybody. Amen? Where are the parents at? It's going to be a bad, bad day. And so we had a system for this, and we knew how it worked. And I remember we're, we're, we're going to, to grandma and grandpa's, and, and, and the toddler is going up the stairs, screaming the whole way because they don't want to take a nap. Big surprise. But grandma and grandpa struggled with that. Like, why you got to do that? 
They don't want this. We got a system. Well, I don't agree with your system. I don't care. <laughs> I didn't say that. And you shouldn't ever say that. Don't, don't say that. You can think it. But this is our boundary. We decided this. We sought God on this. We're raising them. We're, we're paying the cost of this. We're, we're the ones who are hopeful that this will have this kind of an impact on their future. And you need to respect that. Our loyalty is here, and it, it has to be here. It's supposed to be here. And you shouldn't try to, You're trespassing right now. Do you feel that? You're trespassing right now. Now, if you want to come in and say, hey, you know, if you ever want advice on any of that, which I'll never take you up on, but if you ever want advice on any of that, you could offer that. Moses and Jethro, let's tell this real quick. Moses and Jethro. We all know Moses. He's a big hero in the Old Testament. Love Moses. He goes to the burning bush. God tells him to do what? Tells him to go to Egypt and free his people out of slavery in Egypt, right? Moses, Charlton Heston, right? Ten commandments. Here they are. You know, part the waters, the whole thing. And he's this hero of a guy. Moses might be the most clear codependent in the Bible, so let's talk about the story of Moses just really quick. One of the things that nobody talks about is that before Moses goes to Egypt, do you know what's he, what he did? Actually, it might be right when he got there. I'm not exactly sure of the timing of it. It doesn't tell us. But he had a few kids, and he had Zipporah, his wife, and he sends Zipporah, his wife, and his kids to go and live with father-in-law Jethro, grandpa, because he's going into a dangerous situation in Egypt, right? And it's like, let's get the wife and kids out of here. And so that's what he does. Well, after a while, Jethro decides it's time to bring the grandkids back to Moses because that's the greatest blessing of being a grandparent, right? You get to take them home at the end, right? So that's what he does. So this is Exodus 18.5. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, now came to visit Moses in the wilderness, and he brought Moses' wife and two sons with him, and they arrived while Moses and the people were camped near the mountain of God. Now, father-in-law is here, and he's just brought wife and kids back. And he gets to kind of stand back and watch the operation. Verse 13, the next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. And they waited for him from morning until evening. Moses is the only judge for an entire nation. And he stands there, he takes the judge's seat, and anybody who's got a disagreement, any lawsuit, any problem at all, they bring it in front of Moses because he's the man, right? He's it. And isn't there something in this codependent person, their pride kind of plays into it just a tiny little bit? I'm the man, right? And he is the man, right? Like he is God's leader. But Jethro sees this. Verse 16, he's asking Moses about this. And this is Moses' reply. He says, hey, hey, Jethro, when a dispute arises, they come to me, okay? And I am the one who has to settle the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees, and then I give them his instructions. Here comes Jethro. This is not good, his father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Father-in-law is brilliant. And Moses miraculously takes his advice. So he, says, so he goes on to say, he's like, what you got to do is you've got to break the people up into groups of hundreds and thousands, and you've got to find middle management, basically, some people who are gifted by God to come in and do a bunch of these lower-level cases for you, Moses, and only the ones that they can't solve go up to the Supreme Court of Moses, and that's how it needs to work. This is what Jethro tells him. But look at Moses for just a second. I mean, everything worked out and it was all great. But look at what happened. Moses had this little codependent dysfunction inside of his heart before the real problem really got going. What Moses decided was, if somebody comes to me with a spiritual need, it must mean that I'm supposed to meet the need. If they came here, it must mean I'm the man and I better meet it. Not true. Super destructive. Having that philosophy inside of you will open you up to all kinds of spiritual abuse. Don't do that. Wheels are turning, aren't they? 
How does this work, though? What if I'm a narcissist? What if I'm supposed to be unselfish? I know. There's balance. And you've got to seek God on this stuff. Like, it's not just a set of rules. This Christianity thing, you've actually got to hear God direct you, speak to you. And he needed it. And he heard the wisdom in his, fa- in his father-in-law. The book of Proverbs says, in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. In the multitude of counsel, we need people to come and be counselors to us. Look at what, how Moses had no boundaries. And look at what, what it led to, just real quick. This led to his personal exhaustion. He did not have the strength to take care of every single person's dispute, amen? But he tried. But this is where his out-of-balance Christianity led him to. Next, it led to the people's frustration because they all waited in the crazy food line all day and all night waiting for their food. And that's frustrating, amen? Like, if you attended a church like this, like, you would go find a different church, amen? Like, you just would, Next, it also robbed others from God's plan for them because there's all these middle management guys that are out there that God has built up and he's gifted them for this. And Moses thinks, I'm the man, and he misses it. So as soon as Jethro comes in, he's like, there's a much better plan here. God's going to bring all these people into ministry. Isn't that beautiful? And then it robbed Moses' wife and kids because they're going without dad. They're going without husband, and that's wrong. See, God protects your priorities. God cares about the priorities of your life. And this is what boundaries is really all about. It's about giving a no to something that might seem good so that you can give a yes to the best things in your life. That's what, that's what boundaries are. Like, I'm going to create a boundary to protect a priority. So here's the priorities that God gives us. Do we have that slide? There it is. Your worship of God is number one. Your love of your spouse is number two in your life. Your love of your kids is number three, where most of your energy and giving should be going to. And then your ministry, because Jesus told us all to go and make disciples of all nations, amen? So we all have a ministry in the kingdom of God that we are supposed to be focused on. And then number five is everything else. You might be frustrated that you're in an everything else category with somebody right now, right? Right? I get it, me too. But that's the way that that should go. And so boundaries are going to come along and say, listen, I'm Moses here and I'm out of time. I got to find a different structure because I'm neglecting my worship of God or I'm neglecting my kids. Or, you know what I mean? Like that's the way that a Christian should think. And under worship of God, let me just tell you this. I put not only your, your private worship, it's not just listening to like worship music from Hillsong. You know what I mean? That's not what I mean by worship of God. I mean everything that is your relationship with God. So let's talk about Bible reading. Let's talk about prayer. Let's talk about just being still in his presence. Be still and know that I'm God. Also your Sabbath and your rest and healthy rhythms to life. Even exercise and good sleep. Just know the, the psalm says that God grants sleep to those he loves. That's in the Bible. Remember that. It's a big deal. God is everything that is healthy in your life. It's like the heart, right? Like, I was reading about this this week. The heart, it does this thing. We think, oh, it pumps blood around. It does pump blood around. But what it does is it takes oxygen poor blood out of your body and what it does is it takes it through the lungs where it can be imbued with oxygen and it becomes oxygen rich and then it takes that oxygen rich blood and it pumps it back through your body so all the nutrients go where it's supposed to go the heart it needs the lungs amen God is the one in that equation of priorities that breathes life back into you. Everything else on that list, a lot of that stuff, it's like, sure, I'm going to get good health from my wife, and I'm going to get good things back into my heart from my kids. But there's a lot of taking that also goes on, amen? You can shake your heads, that's okay. I like all, all these things, a lot of times they take, or they take for certain seasons. God is the only one that as I give to him, he gives me exponentially back. He, he's the lungs of the human body. 
You know what I mean? It's like, and I need to be strong so that I can do all the other things in my life. And a lot of times what spiritual abuse will do to you and codependency will do to you is it will shut off that top layer and you'll never Sabbath and you'll never get quiet and you'll never do any of the healthy things that God wants you to do and you'll run out of an empty cup. And so you need boundaries to protect those top level things. Matthew 5, 37. Jesus says, just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. This is the thing we need most in our church too. Why didn't you come to this thing? Because little Johnny was sick, you know. Was he sick? Really? Really? Or is that just kind of a legal Christian lie? <sighs> Jesus says, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Hey, will you come and, and, and volunteer for this thing? No, I can't, you know. I think Voldemort's going to invade that day, and I'm going to have to save the world and, you know, dual cores and all that kind of stuff, and it's a whole thing. Like, why do we do this? We, we... Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So why aren't you going to come to the thing? Whew. I'm just going to say no. I'm not going to say no with the implied need that you have for me to give you a really valid reason for my no. Why can't we just say no? Can we say no in the church? Let's say no in the church. Let's say no to things that are really, really good things, but they're not the best things that we have to say yes to that week. And I don't have to explain, and you don't have to explain. And, and, and we're really good at loving people's yeses, and we celebrate people's yeses, do we not? But we don't love people's noes. We need to love each other's noes. Why can't there be assumption in our conversation the next time that you say no to me? It's like, it's cool because God's got this thing that he's led me to do. And even though you're saying no right now, there's other people who are going to say yes, and he's got this. And not only is he, he going to take care of this and give me yeses from another uh, area of the church, but I see you protecting the best things in your life. Thank God for you. I see you saying a healthy no to me right now, not trying to be cruel, not trying to be mean, but you're protecting, and that's good. Can we be that way with each other? Can we stop our little white lies with each other? And, and, and let's go to the other side, like, when you ask somebody for something and they say no and you sit there with the pregnant pause, like, will you tell me why? Why do we do that? We shouldn't do that. No, it's disrespectful. You're getting into their boundary now. How about you just hang back? Say thank you for that no. Move on. I, I, but why? Why aren't you going to come? Am I going to stand here and give you the 15-minute explanation? I could. But if I gave you the 15-minute explanation on the way into Walmart, are you really going to be happy at the end? Because I don't think you will. Because sometimes I'm protecting things that you don't understand. Sometimes I'm protecting things and I'm saying yes to the master who is on the throne, not you. I'm saying yes to him about some things that you don't understand. Maybe the real reason I can't come to your thing is because I know that at this stage in my kids' life, I need to be on the living room floor three nights a week minimum so I can play trucks with them. Are you going to understand that if you don't have kids? No. So why even go there? It's like, no, it's, my answer is no. What if my answer is, I, yeah, I just need to be home for Linda? Because I just know it's like Linda doesn't like carry around some kind of business agenda of all the things that we've got to discuss in our business meeting every week. You know what she expects? She expects me to show up and be in the kitchen and be standing around and available because she might want to talk about our debt. She might want to talk about our bills. She might want to talk about the next vacation or what she's stressed about. And that conversation just might happen organically, which means I better be present I better just be there. So I might be saying no to you, and you're like, what, was something on your schedule? Yes, it is. Linda Trueblood, always on my schedule. And don't feel bad about it. Of all the places in our life, shouldn't we be good at this in the church? 
Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Do you have a no muscle today? How's your no muscle doing? Right? We got to love each other's no's. Next, boundaries in the Bible. How to tell people difficult things. Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. The Bible says sometimes the words that you need to say to a particular person are confrontational. Did you hear me today? Confrontational. You may have to say something confrontational. It may hurt them in the moment. You didn't mean to hurt them in the moment. Your wound was a good wound. Can you say that? You need to be able to say it. The next one is speak truth, but don't be cruel about it. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. You got to speak it, but don't, don't be harsh about it. Be nice. Definitely, that's the counterbalance, right? Be nice. I got a picture of me playing checkers with Davey up there. Now, if you're good at checkers and you're paying attention to the board right now, are you analyzing it? Do you see what's going on? Davy's crushing her dad. That's what's going on. Okay? She's got me. Here's, here's the background on that. Now, I'm going to tell you how I raise my kids. You don't have to do this, all right? This is extra. But, like, for me, I never let the kids win at a game. I just didn't. Um... It just didn't feel truthful to me, and so I wanted, I wanted it to mean something. So I, I wasn't going to be mean about it. I wasn't going to put him down. I wasn't going to trash talk a three-year-old, you know what I mean? I wasn't going to do any of that, but, it's, but at the same time, it's like if we were going to play, we were going to play, and it's like, you know, Cracker Barrel's always got a, a, a checkers board there, and so that, that became a favorite thing for us as a family. We always go there, and we'd always play, and everybody want to play dad, and I, you know, and it's like, and they'd always lose. Every time they would lose. Every time. But they got better and better and better. And, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's growth. But it's like, when she took me to a coffee shop and crushed her dad, how much do you think that meant to her? <laughs> Why do you think her mom stopped and took a picture of the board? <laughs> so that her and I would never forget. Right? Like, like are we going to tell each other the truth? Mom and Dad, how am I doing here? How's this dress look on me? Hmm? Are we going to give a trophy if they didn't win? We can. But does that diminish the meaning of any of the things that we're doing? I think maybe it does. I think one of the principles that we find, and this is, this is the important part of this whole little piece, is that if you say no's at the right time, your yeses will mean ten times as much. And, and if, if you're honest with the people around you in your relationships and you're like, I can't be there, I can't be there, I'm going to be honest with you, I can't. But the time that I do come, you're going to know it may, meant something to me. And you're going to know I didn't come because you coerced me and twisted my arm. And if I've got you, I've got you, got you. You know what I mean? Next, relationship boundaries. Um, Proverbs 25, 17, don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. I didn't make that one up. That's in your Bible. <laughs> if you spend too long at somebody's house, they will not like you. That's what your Bible just said. If you call them and spend too much time on the phone, they will not like you at the end. Some people have like distanced themselves from you. And it's because we don't understand boundaries. Please understand boundaries. Please be careful. Stay for a little while. Don't wear out your welcome. That's just, that's just truth. Next one, Song of Solomon 8.4. Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, do not awaken love until the time is right. Right? Like, don't pretend that you love somebody, especially in dating relationships. But I really want this thing to go further. If you're not ready, it doesn't go further. No means no. That's what that verse is saying. Like, every, every parent of a teenager better know this verse really, really well. Just bookmark it. It's a big one. Again, we tell, sometimes we tell parents, it's like, you got to break the will of your kids. No, you don't. Don't do that. Redeem that will to Jesus. Point them in the direction of Jesus. But we want strong sons and daughters of God. I, like, I want them to be pushy. I want them to know who they are. Have a vision for your kids that's this way. 
Like there's times like I, I love to cuddle with my kids. Can I be real about that? Love it. We're so close. But there have been times when I've said something to Gracie or something to Davey and they did not like it very much and they were kind of mad at me in the moment and I go in for a hug and they're like, mm, dad. And the thing is, that's good. Thing is, they drew a boundary there and I need to honor it. That, there, there needs to be some holiness about that moment of like you said no and, and love doesn't get forced in this house ever. Because why? Because if they're ever in the back seat of some blockhead's car and he's pushing for love, I want her to deck him in the jaw. You want to break her will? I don't want her will broken. I want it strong. She decides to give herself away in the right way. And then it means something. And it's real. And the kingdom of God will be taken by force, not by weak, passive children of God. Know who you are. Strength is important. It's for freedom that Christ sets you free. I need to calm down. That was, that was that meant something to me. Adult children, which is an oxymoron. Let's talk about this. Proverbs 23, 14, physical discipline may well save them from death. So this is spare the rod, spoil the child kind of, kind of a thing. And I know this is controversial, and I know we're, we're not all into spanking here, and I, I get it. I'll just say this. I think the deeper principle in that verse is consequences are good. And having some structure over your kids and allowing them to feel the consequences of their own decisions while they're kids is good and will only help them. Because we do have, an, we do have adult children around and even in the church who still are not facing the consequences of their own decisions. And we're rescuing too much. Proverbs 19:19, 19, 19, a man of great wrath will pay the penalty. For if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. It's fruitless to keep rescuing people. Titus 3.10, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him. The Bible's talking about a boundary there. It says that it gets to a certain point with some people and their destructive behavior. This is back to the toxic person question where you have to draw a boundary and say, we can't be around this anymore. But you never do that as a surprise and you never do it without speaking to what the issue is. And this is where we fall sometimes. Again, in our people pleasing, we don't want to say the hard words. Sometimes we only take hard actions. That verse tells us, no, you have to tell them, and you have to tell them at least twice. You have to tell them exactly what's going on and exactly why, and then, then you can put up a boundary. And I know the screens are flashing right now, but let me just tell you this. Can we focus for a second? Because this is so, so important. Talking about boundaries is something that is not easy. And if it seems like I'm making it simple, I'm not. It's not simple. These kinds of situations, if they're in your life at all, they are highly complex. They're very, very difficult. And they're heartbreaking. People use the words like tough love. It's not tough love. It's excruciating love. That's what's required. It's tearing your heart out kind of stuff. And if you've been through it, you know. And nobody needs to look at your situation with your kids or your extended family and talk about it like it's easy because it's not easy. And you need counsel in your life and you need help in your life and you need to run your situation past several people and you need to get some strategies. Okay, more verses. Second Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. It's self-explanatory. Second Corinthians 8, 13 through 14, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need. And that one's important because it says that when we're giving to each other, it's not about one of us gets to an empty cup and we give away everything while other people are fine. You see the balance in that verse? Give some. But don't empty everything out and don't ignore your kids. Next, Jesus had boundaries. <laughs> I love this one. I'm going to mow through it fast. Jesus said no to his mom and his brothers. Some moms in this room need to hear that. He did. Look it up. 
Jesus said no to Peter's agenda for him. He said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I've got a different plan with, with God. I, I see that you need that, Peter. I see that you feel strongly about this, but I'm not going to do that. He refused p- miracles for people in his hometown. He often left needy crowds so that he could go and he could rest and he could pray. And he taught his disciples to do the same thing. Jesus knew his limits. And he went back to that first priority and said, God, I need some Sabbath in my life. I need some help in my life. And he let the lungs come back in. He spoke tough love to the rich young ruler. He spoke grace, but also truth to the adulteress. He said, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Jesus took a nap, amen? Oh, come on. Jesus took a nap, and he went to dinner with close friends. The reason I put that last one on there is sometimes it's tempting to look at somebody who's a spiritual leader or who's in ministry and say, they should do nothing but help other people. Jesus made self-healing decisions, and God gave him that. Jesus, you think Jesus ever did anything because of a guilt trip? You think anybody coerced Jesus Christ into anything? If you've read the Gospels, you know that's not true. He had boundaries. Jesus had boundaries. But wait, wait, wait. The Bible says, though, that we should, there it is, deny our selfish desires, right? Doesn't the Bible say that we should respond to others' requests and go the extra mile? Doesn't it say that we should reconcile broken relationships and humbly put others above ourselves? So let me give you some practical answers. Are we supposed to deny ourselves and go the extra mile? Yes. Give of yourself willingly from your strength, but not because of a guilt trip. And not not to where you're empty, Someone asked John the Baptist one time in the scripture, they said, how do we follow Jesus? And he said, if you've got two cloaks, give to the one who has zero. And you know what's assumed in John's words? You've still got a coat left and you're not going to freeze to death. Sometimes we don't see that in our Christianity. You got two, give one away. He doesn't say give both away. Or should we reconcile? Yes, yes. But in one spot, Paul says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. He does not say, look at every relationship in your life that might not have peace and feel guilty perpetually about it. As much as it depends on you, have you done the things that God called you to do to bring about peace in that situation? If you have, sleep well at night. And then lastly, should we put other people above ourselves? Yes, we should. But we should choose to do it in our freedom and in our strength. We should choose to invite other people in. But that doesn't mean that we put them on the seat on the throne of our lives. Someone that we serve, someone that we help, someone that we love is not our master. And that's the difference. The Bible tells you to not let people take that position with you. So how do I have healthy boundaries? Number one, don't have boundaries with God. He's the one relationship in your life where you don't have boundaries. Why? Because Jesus stands at the door and knocks, and it's your heart, and he wants to come in. And if you're a believer today, you've swung the door wide open, and you have let Jesus in willingly. So Jesus comes in because you put him there, right? You were not coerced. Nobody twisted your arm. You put Jesus in that spot. And now from this point forward, you should have no boundaries with him. So that's number one. Number two, your motive should be to protect or choose your highest priorities. It should not be so that you can live selfishly and you should never make a boundary in order to have revenge against someone. And then lastly, healthy boundaries should unleash beauty into your life if you're doing it right. And you should ask yourself that. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing boundaries here. Am I becoming a more selfish person? Am I becoming, over time, a more self-centered person? Because if I'm doing boundaries right, I should become a more healthy person. If I'm doing boundaries right, I should unleash beauty into my life. Other things that, that, that maybe were kind of, I don't know, kind of small and dark, even though they had the Christian label on them because I was coerced into it, they should start to become beautiful in my life. Okay, so about a month ago, 
Someone gave $10,000 to this church as a single one-time donation, and they gave it in cash, and they put it in an envelope in the joy boxes at the back of the room. And our counting team was like, emergency, what do we do with this? And we're like trying to, you know, get it to the bank and all this kind of stuff. What in the world do we do with that? Here's the deal. We make a really big deal at this church about telling you guys that we don't, we don't know as pastors who gives what here. Why do we do that? We want this to be a safe place. No twisting of arms, no coercion. We don't pass baskets to you on Sunday morning. We don't pass plates back and forth to where the person down the row is like, why didn't you put more in there? We don't want to create that kind of an environment. Why? Because we respect your boundaries. And if you give, we want you to give wholeheartedly to God, motivated by nothing else. Whoever this person was, they gave cash, which means I don't even know whose name is on the check. Nobody in this church does. So can we just embrace the idea that there's a whole level, different level of beauty to that? Because there's freedom, there's greater surrender. And when there's surrender, there's greater beauty to the act because nobody made them do it. And they got nothing else out of it. Right? Because nobody could give them anything else for it. This last Thursday was Veterans Day and Jake gave me a call from Phoenix, Arizona. And he's like, hey, it's Veterans Day, Dad. I wanted to give you a call, and I'm not a veteran. But he's like, but I know Grandpa was a veteran, and he died about two years ago. And he's like, I just saw it was Veterans Day. I thought that it might stir some things up about your loss of Grandpa, and I just wanted to see how you're doing today. I mean, what level of beauty is that, guys? You know? I'm not guilting him on a weekly basis. Why don't you call me more? You know, good sons, they call their parents more. Right? It's like, it, there's none of that. There's just this freedom. And so when the call comes through, do you know how gigantic that is? It just matters so much. And this is the kind of beauty that our God is trying to create in every single one of you. See, boundaries isn't about being cruel. Boundaries is about protecting your jurisdiction so that when you give, it's a real gift. When you love, it's real love, amen? It matters. Would you guys stand? Holy Spirit, each of us are in a different spot on this. You know our family background. You know exactly what we need to be challenged about today. Maybe this message, maybe 100% of it wasn't for us, maybe just a part. Lord, you know the part. And God, we're going into the holidays. We're going into Thanksgiving. We're going into Christmas. Lots of parties, lots of extended family, lots of sometimes toxic stuff that we're going to be facing in the next few months. So Jesus, would you just come right now, Lord, will you tell us the thing that we need to do, the boundary we need to create? Give us a new way to walk. We want to walk like Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.